just make sure everything's five by five. We have about five minutes before we're actually officially started. I'm gonna get connected to Twitch chat right quick. Um, Y'all just let me know. Smasher, welcome back. Matt Humph, excellent, excellent, excellent. Five by five. All right, cool. So uh, again, I'm Das, and I'm on a virtual field trip today. Uh, we are out in New York City at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. It's World Water Day, so I figured what better place to celebrate World Water Day than aboard an aircraft carrier, if you can get that right quick. We are uh, getting ready to go up onto the, uh, I guess, bridge, tower, superstructure, island? I don't island. Even know. Island, there you go, um, of the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. So. To do a little bit of introduction here, I don't just show up with a camera, right? I've got an IRO backpack on, I want to gun around IRO backpacks. I got my little Sony AS300 right here. We're using a much nicer camera today, um, but I don't just show up with a camera and start streaming, right? We have permission from the museum to be here. Um, it's after hours, the museum's actually closed right now, so there's no guests walking around or anything like that. And uh, the museum has been gracious enough, not just to let us come here after hours and get actual permission to film or stream or whatever, but they've also sent a tour guide to hang out with us. So I've got Mr. Mike Murtaugh here. How are you doing? Who is a senior tour guide with the museum. Something like Something that. Something like that. Can I say that? That's what they told me to yeah, put. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> That's what they told me to put. Um, and he's going to take us for a little bit of a tour. We're going to see how our signal holds up as we walk through the superstructure of the carrier here. Um, Mike, thank you so much for joining it's us. It's my pleasure. We'll see how it works. Chat, if we die, like if, if our stream signal drops or something like that, that's expected. Just stand by, let us know in chat what the deal is. We will have time for Q&A as well, so I've got my phone out. I'm not being rude, I'm not like bored by you or anything. I'm, I understand completely. <laughs> I'm reading questions from Twitch yeah. chat. So if you have a question for Mike, you wanna know about the Intrepid, you wanna know about what's going on here, um, or what we do with our virtual field trips, feel free to ask in Twitch chat, because I'll be reading some Twitch chat as we go. Um, Twitch chat says, hello Mr. Murtaugh, thanks for joining us. That's my pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you guys for coming aboard. Good deal. Um, do you think we're cool to leave that there, or should we take yeah, it with us? I think you'll be okay. All right, we're cool to leave our stuff right this way. All right, and I've got I've got cables hanging off me too. We'll, I'll take them all when we get up there. <laughs> so we're on Intrepid. Is you Intrepid most certainly are. Still floating in the water. It depends on the time of day. It depends um, on the time of day. Apparently. Intrepid's been here since uh, 2009. Um, without moving. Okay. For a year and a half before that, they were in New Jersey and Staten Island for some major repairs. Right. Before that, they'd been here since uh, sometime in 1985. Uh, 1981. Uh, okay, I like how we're walking through. The entire museum's closed, and we're still walking through the little yeah. entrance thing. Oh yeah, it gets really busy here sometimes. <laughs> it's an official tour. Like we're we're walking through just like a museum guest. Suffice to say that this is the Hudson River, so the silt builds up over time. Right. So in the years since they last dredged around us, there's been a substantial buildup. So at really low tide, we're on a pretty spongy bottom. Yeah. But you can still see the ship move. If you're really sensitive, you can feel it sometimes, especially in heavier yep. weather. You can hear it too. You can I know. hear it very much. Hear it. But the coolest thing is if you're on the pier and you look at the lines anytime a rope's doing a job they have you call the line right you watch the lines there you can actually see them sway with the movement of the ship which is pretty cool <laughs> no kidding. right this way he just opened up a hatch in the side of the ship so that we can go in it's also nice and warm in here again watch the signal we're going into a big met that hurt idiot that's we're going to a big metal structure um so if we drop signal we'll see yeah. we will come right back if we do drop signal don't worry folks the is not under attack it's been quite a while since that last happened <laughs> Do we need to secure this hatch or anything? Or no, just... it's okay. All right, he said it's good. Um, should I go first or you want to go first? All right, I'm going to go first. There's like these little skinny ladders that yeah. we're going up here. The this official <laughs> Navy ladders. Now, we're climbing up them nice and slow. We were going down and we go nice and slow too, but the Navy guys would have grabbed the handles and slid on down. You just slid all the way down? Yep. <laughs> no kidding. We're, in this we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're in this little teeny tiny space. I'm very curious as to whether or not the signal is going to work. <laughs> Oh, and the on for the lights, the little button on the back of it there. So, chat, what's the status check? Like, do we still have signal inside the aircraft carrier tower? I'm going to keep saying the wrong word over and over. Do we call okay. it tower? The island. Island. The island is the, the official island. term. The signal's apparently still good inside Excellent. the island. So, um, where are we at? Right now, we're actually passing the uh, navigator's stateroom. You take a look in here. Navigator's usually in the top couple of people in the overall hierarchy of the crew. Right. He gets his own room. Notice, too, where the room is located. Right within the island, so he's pretty close to the scene of the action. 
from here we're going to be moving um, a little further around up into the chart house and to the captain's bridge that they actually steer the ship from. So he's going to probably want to be pretty close to the heart of all that stuff going on. Gotcha. So pretty is this where is this sort of the, the command center for the whole carrier? Because it seems like it's sort of exposed, sticking up on top of the aircraft carrier. So the island is essentially the brains of the ship, right? Most of the uh, the control for the ship's going to come from here. Right. But uh, it's important to keep in mind that. The heart of an aircraft carrier is really its flight deck. Right, right. So yes, it does seem very, very exposed. To some degree, it needs to be. They sort of need uh, that position that's kind of you know, what's observation, going on, yeah. everything that's going on. And there are areas deeper in the ship that are protected. We'll talk right. a little bit more about this upstairs, but this gets knocked out. Other areas can take over. Gotcha. But the reality is, World War II particularly, they weren't a major target here. If okay. you're a Japanese plane, you get through our defenses. Here, yes, you might be able to kill the captain, but if you take out the flight deck, you've rendered this ship combat ineffective. Ah. You might as well have sunk the Intrepid. So you're, you're better off doing damage to the flight deck than hitting Precisely. the tower, I guess. Intrepid's I gotcha. hit by five kamikaze aircraft throughout World War II. Wow. And the most effective are the ones that dive directly into the flight deck. Straight into the flight deck. Exactly. No kidding. Knocked the Intrepid out for months at a time. Sent her back to California twice for major repairs. Wow. Adding the torpedo hit three times. She goes all the way back to California during the war for repair. No kidding. God, let's keep on going mm -hmm. up the... Uh, up the set here and see what we got. <laughs> we'll talk about this room a little bit more on the way back down, but this is the Admiral's stateroom. I'm going to get out of your way yeah, so you, you can talk. I, there's well, like no space area. We'll keep moving because I want to tell you more about the Admiral when we're in his uh, command okay. center. Okay. But just suffice to say for now, this is his stateroom. All right. Admiral stateroom behind us. Admiral stateroom? Got it. <laughs> and Chad, if we drop the signal, let us know. Um, I thought we were going to go up the stairs on the outside, but this is way cooler. <laughs> Again, if you're just joining us, we're on a virtual field trip right now. We are in the island of the Intrepid Seer and Space Museum. It's an aircraft carrier converted into a museum in New York City. Um, oh, this is much less echoey in here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all right. How's all right. this? <laughs> what do you call your uh, viewers, Twitchers? Uh, I call them chat. Chat? I just say chat. So okay. if you want them to do something, like go to Intrepid's website, chat. You just tell them chat. Okay, chat. Right now we are inside the <laughs> chart house. So this is really where they're going to uh, kind of do the navigation from the point of view of looking at maps and charts, figuring out where they are. Right. You look around you. We've tried to recreate this space as much as we can. Cool. A couple of important things to take a note of in here. Uh, Intrepid's built during uh, World War II, right? They right. lay her keel down the uh, six days before the Pearl Harbor attack, December 1st, 1941. Right. They thought it'd take three years to build it. They get it done in 18 months because the war is going on. No kidding. So this is a time when you have radio communications, you have phone lines running through the ship. You can see a lot of those communications right over here on the wall. Right. Back behind um, the camera there, yeah. Suffice to say, though, the ship's going into combat, right? There's always the possibility communications are going to be knocked out. Right. So once you guys have had a good chance to look at some of that communications equipment, if you look right over here above the chart table, okay. you're going to notice a bunch of metal tubes hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> oh, these horns right yeah, here? Those are speaking tubes. Speaking tubes. It's going to allow those guys to communicate with other parts of the ship. <laughs> it seems like a strange thing to have, and it's not here as the primary means of communication. It's a right. backup. But if everything else gets knocked out, well, the next step down from that is sending runners to different parts of the ship. And no communications, kidding. as fast as they need to be, that's vital. <laughs> now, that voice, the tube will only carry your voice two, three decks. So it's just a, it's just a tube? Just a tube. It's not like a it's speaker like, or a it's microphone It's like when you're a there. kid with the two cups and the string going between yeah. them, a little more sophisticated, a little more effective. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Since it can only carry your voice so far, you might need to talk to the engine room. Right. There are junctures where these things come together. Right. And there's a guy standing there whose job is to take one message and relate it into the next tube and send it on further <laughs> no down. No kidding. <laughs> They're there just in case the system might be needed. So normally they'd have regular, like, wired communications, like Absolutely. microphones and speakers. Yeah, these and stuff. are sound tower telephones, all right. sorts of things like that, ship-to-ship -ship radio, the whole nine yards. The whole nine yards. But just in case they have these old school, I'm going to say brass. Are they brass? Yeah, absolutely. These old school brass speaking tubes, and they could only go so far, so there would be somebody sitting there listening sitting in one ear and then yelling the message into the next tube to, to carry it throughout Absolutely. the ship. Absolutely. That's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. In chat, remember, we are actually reading Twitch chat while we're here. The museum's closed. We have special permission to be here with Mike, our, our tour guide. So if you have questions or anything like that as we go, um, I told Mike I was going to make him talk for 30, 45 minutes straight. Y'all need to do some talking too. So uh, I am reading chat right now. What day is it? It's Friday right now. It's Friday, isn't it? I believe so. People don't believe that we're live usually. Ah. They're like, this isn't live. This is pre recorded. <laughs> no, it's live no, right now. We are live. No kidding. Yeah. And then some of the equipment in here, I mean, Absolutely. it's not up to date computers. No, definitely right? not. I mean, most of this stuff is, uh, you know, connected to what they're doing up here. But, you know, if you look around at it, these are not microchips. These are vacuum tube technology. Vacuum this is tube. Early stuff. God. Um, it's I, a, I wonder if there's more power in my cell phone than this entire room right now. Probably the entire ship, at least <laughs> if you take out the stuff the museum put on board. Wow. Remember, she's retired in 1974, and right? the information revolution really comes after that. Yep, yep. So 
while the stuff that's on here probably would have looked advanced to that guy back in World War II, by 1974, he probably would still know his way around some of this equipment. Right. But you take somebody today and put him in here, doesn't have any experience You'd with this like, stuff. What? It's not as much time that's passed from World War II to 74, but they're going to be much more confused by it. The revolution God. happens after. No you know, It was kidding. just evolution before that. <laughs> we get to the next room. I have a great example of that for you There's guys. There's more great examples. And I also see some questions uh, like about what types of planes were stationed and stuff. We're going to get a view of parts of the flight deck, so mm -hmm. I'm going to save some of the questions when we have the view out there. Keep coming with us, though. There was a good question. Is all the gear in here original, or was it collected from other ships? That's a good question. The uh, the equipment that you see, the the, um, the for back of a better term, the electronic equipment that you see, a right. lot of that's probably original, but probably not all of it. Intrepid, uh, when it's retired in 1974, they didn't know it was going to become a museum. Right. It's not until uh, you know the late 70s and really 81 when it's definitive this is going to become a museum. So a lot of stuff was taken off to fill out other ships that were still in service. Gotcha. Other things might have been taken off for different purposes. But when we come around here, like when you look at the staterooms downstairs, you're going to see the captain's sea cabin in a moment. The books, the bedding, all that stuff. They're period. Right. They're not original. Gotcha. That kind okay. of stuff would have changed as the officers on board Right, changed. the captain took it with him. Exactly. Like That said, our archives department does has a substantial collection of original Intrepid stuff, mostly donated by former crew members. Gotcha. Last uh, time I've been here, we've celebrated the 70th and 75th anniversary of the ship. Right. Both times we had over 300 former crew members and their families come to experience it. No Many kidding. of them brought stuff with them that they want the museum to be able to use to help interpret and tell their stories. Wow. So if there's any uh, former crew members listening, we are always happy to take anything <laughs> that you might have or make copies of any documents you might have. I'm going to say it right quick. Um, so we interview lots of people on the yeah. stream, right? Um, I appreciate the fact that you're a tour guide because you have a voice that carries. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have Mike wired up with a mic and stuff because a lot of times, Mike on mic, I guess. Um, and a lot of times it's hard to hear what the guests are saying. Chad, are you having any trouble hearing what he's saying at all? Because I don't think so. <laughs> we appreciate you. If I get too loud, let me know because I do have that problem too. <laughs> it's fun. Me too. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, so if you're still wondering, chat, we're at Intrepid Sea, and sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. We have special permission from the museum to uh, do a tour, and we are actually in the island of the museum right now. We are getting ready to see, I guess, where they drove the uh, ship from. Yeah, we are stepping into the Captain's Bridge. The Captain's or Bridge. Or the Navigation Bridge. Names are interchangeable. But this is, like you said, this is where they're steering the ship from. It's no fair. He's behind the glass, right. chat. You want like, come back here too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I can make it. How yeah, did absolutely. you get back, come there? back here? Oh, there's a door. Yeah. <laughs> this is all part of that behind the scenes for the after This is hours. the behind the scenes. Nice. It's, it's like night at the museum. Now, one thing before we talk about the tech. Take a okay. look around. You pointed out the brass before. Look at how shiny the brass is in here. Right. I'll put a little plug in for some of our volunteers. Uh, we have, there's estimate, about 50,000 people served on this ship throughout its history in the Navy, right? No served from 1943 to 74. When she opened up in New York, there were a lot of folks who lived in the area who came down to volunteer who were part of that crew. Right. And there was a small pool of them who every day, for years, every weekend, would come up here and polish all this brass. Other the museum ships doesn't look this shiny. Some of them <laughs> I've been through on. some and it looks like pigeons live inside Exactly, because yeah. brass is hard to maintain. Some yeah. of those guys have passed on, some of them just can't make it up here anymore. Right. But the volunteers who they trained and took over for them, to this day, keep that tradition of life of keeping all this brass as polished as they can. Yeah, it looks and really nice. that's why it still looks the way it does. I mean, it's you can see your face shape. in the uh, helm here. Yeah, see, can we see the camera in the helm? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here, chat. There you are. You should be able to see the the camera that has all the transmitters and stuff on it for the live stream here. <laughs> the room we're in itself, this is where they're going to steer the ship from. And really right. The center of it is, of course, what we're looking at here. You call this a ship's wheel. It's really called the helm. The helm, all right. And it's controlling the rudder at the far aft end of the ship, that flap that moves any kind of watercraft left and right. Right, right. So there's a man standing here pretty much round the clock when the ship is at sea, and he is maneuvering this ship. He's driving the ship. Now, that helm is uh, one of the originals that was on board the ship. It was located elsewhere, moved here when we opened as a museum. But okay. man's standing here, pilot this thing all over the world across those 30 years. So when we bring guests up here, we try to convey to them, you're standing in that spot. All those guys that over all those years, this thing went all over the world. Right. That's and a we've, powerful idea. We've been all over the uh, the Intrepid as well. We've been out of the hangar deck. We've done interviews. We're on the back on the shuttle pavilion, all over the flight deck. And so it's a huge ship too. Massive. It's not small, but the entire ship is driven, steered from right here. Absolutely. I gotta ask, is this a physical connection to the rudder? Ah. Or is this like, oh, you turn this and then somebody down there is like, all right, let's no, turn it. It's a physical connection to physical the rudder. Connection. But it's not like it's a fly-by-wire system. Like that. This is predates that. So this right. is a series of probably, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but gears, levels, right. whatever Hydraulics it is. Hydraulics or something. Something like yeah. that that goes all the way back there. Um, but, let's say for a moment, where you asked about this being a target, let's say for a moment, I don't know, Kamikaze crashes and takes out the island. What right. happens next? Well, there's an identical setup to this, just 
for all the way forward, just below the flight deck. That's called secondary con. Okay. They can take over immediately and control all of this. No kidding. In the worst combat situation, the XO, the number two man in charge of the ship below the captain, he waits down there just in case. So you have them split up, I guess. Precisely. The command of the, the ship, there's some of the command up here, then some of the command down there just in case. Exactly. And there are at least three other locations that can take over if that is compromised as well. Three other locations. Three other locations. One of them's midship. The right. idea being the closer in you are to the center, you're protected. And that's right. just a basic control on the wall to steer the thing. Right. But if all else fails, somebody can go all the way to the back end, go all the way down into the steering box, they call it, right. and actually control the levers like this down there that will control the rudder right at the like rudder. Like right at the rudder, Absolutely. there's another set of wheels or something you could turn it's with. It's still got hydraulic power hydraulic running Hydraulic power, gotcha. Now, you were on a smaller ship in World War II, a destroyer. You could get like 40 guys and actually move a manual rudder. This is too big for that. <laughs> this is too but big for that. But suffice to say that the final line, the, the last backup, if you will, is literally at the rudder is itself. at the rudder just itself. Just in case. God. And warship, especially an aircraft carrier like this, is all about redundancy. Yeah. Keeping it functioning moment to moment, day to day, but also in the worst of human circumstances. Right, understood. And all this reflects that. No kidding. So this is, I mean, we're talking about this is where a steer from. Mm -hmm. I see there's like another, ah, was it yeah. a throttle? It's not a throttle, you take I guess. Look at the sides of that. Folks yeah. are probably familiar with that. They've seen Titanic, because they show that a couple of times. Any right. kind of old ship. That's called an engine telegraph machine. Okay. And here is more of what you were talking about a moment ago. That doesn't control the engines. Okay. But it sends a signal to a similar looking device that's down in the engine rooms that tells them what kind of speed you want. Gotcha. Two levers for each of the engine rooms. And if you look at it, you know, it's on stop now. But for example, if you were to go one third in either direction, you're going, uh, Third forward, third reverse. Right. Um, you know, ahead, full, flank. Flanking speed is when you're going so fast, it's not really sustainable for the ship. Right. You have to do it over a short it's distance. It's like some sort of emergency sprint thing or Precisely. something. Precisely. You know, something like this, an engine like that's not meant to be run at full stress. Right, right, right. The right. Clock. And if you look up there, those are the RPM indicators. You okay. can see the shaft, shaft number four, three, two, one. Can that's I step back there and yeah, point? Absolutely. Is that cool? Yeah, that's look at this. That's for each of the propeller shafts. So these. And that's telling you what the RPMs are, the rotations per minute for each of the propellers. Right. Okay. So you would uh, dial it in here, and you would look for the result up there. Okay. So I, I got to ask. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to keep stepping around yeah, here. Absolutely. Um, if I was, if we were commanding the ship, we were trying to maneuver the ship. Mm -hmm. There's a lever for each engine room. You said, yeah. right? Could I put one lever in one position, another lever in another position, or were they always the same? Like, could you turn with differential steering? That is a very good I question. That, that I'm not positive of, but okay. I suspect that under certain circumstances, yes, you could. Okay. Um, it's just curious of, that there's two, right? Yeah. Two levers. So. As part of normal operation, I'm not sure how frequently they would do that. I do know that if the rudder is damaged, that is usually how you're going to try to steer your ship. Gotcha. There's okay. a period in World War II when Intrepid's hit by a torpedo at the aft end of the ship, right? Right. It uh, unfortunately kills um, about a dozen men, but the most important thing about it from a structural point of view is it bends and jams the rudder at a pretty severe angle. Right. Now, at first, they try to steer the Intrepid to get her home using the propellers instead. Right. You go faster on one side, slower on all the other. And that's probably where you would probably dial what they that were trying in. to do. Gotcha. They realize pretty quick that it's not going to work. This is the first time a carrier of this design, Trep is relatively new, is damaged. Right. Every time the wind comes up, it causes the ship to spin around and point back in the general direction of Japan. Wow. The captain Tom's not the spread. way they wanted to go. No. And the captain <laughs> actually wrote in his report he wasn't so interested in going to Japan just right. yet. <laughs> they come up with this crazy plan to make up for this. They gather all the thickest canvas they can find on board, um, a lot of like cargo netting materials like that. They stitch it together and basically create one gigantic sheet or sail. Right. Now at that time. Right below the flight deck, the front, oh, I don't know, about 50, 60 feet of the ship was open to the elements, like a parking garage up there, right? Okay, Wind just like open through. windows, no glass. Exactly. Okay. So they, on one half, rigged the sail from floor to ceiling back there, so when the wind came in, it hit the sail and pushed the front end over the water just a little. <laughs> that push from the sail counteracted the bend in the rudder at the back end of the ship, bringing the ship on a relatively straight course back to Pearl Harbor and no safety. No kidding. We are filming today on the only American aircraft carrier to have ever literally sailed into port. <laughs> sailed yeah. into port. It's that nice. World War II ingenuity. <laughs> That's, um, I never knew that. This is why we love coming on virtual field trips like this, y'all. I could walk around here and I could be like, and now we're in this room. Awesome. Shiny, right? But when we get a, an experienced tour guide like Mike here to walk around the ship and tell us stories like that, Mike, dude, thank you so much my for pleasure. the time. My pleasure. One of my favorite stories. Um, can I put that hat on? Sure. <laughs> I just saw the hat there. I like, can't guarantee who wore it last, but go for it. <laughs> I just wanted to look at it right quick. I mean, I saw this sort of thing. I feel like I should have this on while we're doing the stream, right? Now, if we were in combat, that'd be very accurate. If you look over here, right? you can actually see there's a whole stack of them along the wall. Oh, this really? This is like the Marines or the Army. You're not issued your helmet you wear all the time. Right. But the idea is that if we go into combat, there are helmets available to put on to protect you. Gotcha. Because let's think about it. The ship gets hit by something, it's made of metal. 
flying splinters, pieces of the metal, that's going to be a serious, dangerous thing for the guys. Yeah, it makes board. sense. So protecting your head is vital. So you just grab the helmet that's near the station that you're assigned Precisely. to or something I mean, like some that, Some people right? would have the helmet, depending on what their job is. There's a Marine contingent on board. Sure. But the reason there's a stack like that up here is so the people up here can just grab them. Gotcha, You're not going to gotcha, want gotcha. the guy who's manning this to run back to his rack to find his right, helmet. Right, to go find it and have to run Precisely. Over here Nor do you want to keep his and every other guy who does that all day long's helmet up here just in case. Right, there'd be like a line of helmets along the way. Oh, wall. they'd be everywhere. Hey, I have the helmet on. I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to like walk off with this, but we're about to go to another part of the ship. We are. All right, chat. I'm going to put my helmet down, and we're going to keep going to the uh, to the we're heading to the Admiral's Bridge. The Admiral's we'll make Bridge. A couple of small stops on the way, but the Admiral's Bridge. Ultimately. That's the next place here, chat. <laughs> that thing's heavy too. Yeah. Jeez. Needs to be. All right. Continuing on, making sure I don't get hung up on anything, and let's keep on keeping on to the Admiral's Bridge. So this that we were on right now was the Captain's Bridge. Captain's Bridge. The Admiral's Bridge is another place. And really quick, if you can see it, you want to zoom in on this. This is a list of all the captains who commanded Intrepid throughout her history. Wow. You'll notice there's a lot of them, and a lot of them weren't here for very long. Most cases, around about a year, maybe a little bit more. Right. Now, during the war, war time, that's mostly because these guys moved up pretty fast. Admiral Sprague, who was here with the sail, he was an admiral commanding, an, pardon me, Captain Sprague at the time, right. was an admiral commanding a group of ships by the end of the war. Gotcha. But the rest of the time, the Navy never wants these guys in one place for too long. They right. They rotate shore duty, duty on a ship. It also kind of keeps people on their toes, constantly moving the captains around. Gotcha. All right, Chet, we're going to the next bridge here. This is a little more st spacious out yeah. this way. So this is uh, not the Admiral's Bridge, but this is where the navigator would be located on right. board if we were pulling into port or pulling up alongside a ship. You know, when the Intrepid's out at sea, there's a tremendous amount of supplies. Now, Intrepid doesn't stop in the middle of the water for a supply ship to unload. They do what they call underway resupply or an unrep. Right. And the two ships sail next to each other at equal speed and basically use a trapeze structure of ropes and lines to move equipment back and forth. Gotcha. From that chair, the navigator can clearly see this entire side of the ship. Yeah, it's, it's it sort of hangs out over the side. Point. Exactly. Yeah. To be able to see what they need to do while they're offloading and unloading. No, it, it, that's, it's crazy, right? This is a massive vessel. Absolutely. And you have people that are commanding it. You have a navigator over here. But even though it's really good visibility, it's half the ship. Yeah. You can see forwards. You can see out the side. You can see aft. But you can't see the other oh, yeah, port side of the ship. Oh, yeah. There's a whole lot more warship to think about. No kidding. There's actually a picture here. A little artistic design in it, you know, the way they painted it, or the yep. way they, they did the picture, the Colors, exposure. Yep. But you can see that going on. They're both moving. Imagine how difficult that is to coordinate two ships like that perfectly yeah. to get that pallet of supplies back and, and forth. And they had a little pulley system, like, moving yeah. stuff back and forth. It basically starts with a shotgun firing a grappling hook. Really? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Shotgun firing a grappling yeah. hook. Nice. <laughs> you guys uh, from the New York area? Uh, no, Basically. I'm not. No. Oh, okay. He, uh, camera guy, Air Force is, but. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a um, uh, Rescue One, which is one of the FMY's trucks that's involved with that kind of stuff. They have a picture of what looks like an eagle clutching a shotgun on the side of it. Right. It's not uh, for, for, for military use. That's because they used the same thing it's in the early days shotgun. of fire rescue to be able to fire that grappling hook for a rescue mission. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. And, Chad, I am still reading Twitch chat here as we go. Um, let's see here. So if I see is, any other questions, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of the outer part of the Captain's Bridge. Okay. Uh, a little bit more of an observation point here. You know, you can see a little better what's going on around you. And if right. you look over here, these are the hatches into where we just came from. Look at these big, thick metal pieces oh, here. Oh, wow. If you need to button up to protect yourself, that stuff folds up and blocks off that space, no. making it like an armored box. Yeah, and it's, I mean, that's like almost an inch worth of steel, oh, it yeah. looks like. To protect the guys who are in there. And it's got a little barely, like a little tiny slit that you can see out. So this is the part that you were saying was originally just open air. Yes, absolutely. This... During, yeah, during um, World War II, up until the ship was rebuilt in the 50s, this was more like a parapet on a castle. Right. You'd have an edge there, probably some equipment. Okay. But you would just be out in the open looking around for here. Gotcha. They close it in more probably for weather protection than anything else. Yeah, I that mean, makes sense. Post war, Intrepid's not in the Pacific anymore. She spends a lot of time in the North Atlantic. It's right. probably too cold it's to be cold, out there otherwise. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing that's important to keep in mind is you get a pretty good perspective on the ship here. Right. People often say to us, but well, how does the guy inside there know where he's going to steer? Right. You don't need to. It's important to understand that when you're on board a ship like this, the person who's moving the ship, who's steering it, the helmsman, he's not worried about where he's going beyond what the officer telling him to do is, gotcha. you know. So he's not looking out and saying, oh, I need to turn a little bit to the starboard side there, right? No, no, he's no. just, somebody tells him to turn 80 degrees or 
10 degrees or whatever. Sharks, radar, all kinds of equipment that are doing that. Not to mention the fact that when you're on an aircraft carrier, we'll talk more about this in the Admiral's Bridge, you're at the yep. center of what's going on. Yep, Other yep. ships are basing their location off of you. That makes sense. Most of the world's oceans have been pretty well mapped by the 19th century, so you know what's around you. Right. But you think about it like this. This is not just a question of technology. We think back to a pirate ship, right? Our, all of our image of Captain Hook's ship. Sure. Is it the guy at the wheel that's really paying attention to what's going on? It's the guy up in the crow's nest. The guy in the crow's nest. Around. Yeah. Here, we just happen to have an electronic crow's nest that by the time we get to Intrepid's retirement involves an aircraft hundreds of feet up that can see from here to Boston, oh, 250 wow. miles in any direction. And, and they would take pop out, I'll point information out from an aircraft that's like hover, loitering Precisely. overhead or something like that. You can just barely see it here. If you look out the uh, window there, you see that big kind of bubble sticking off of uh, the aircraft that is... Uh, Two down from where we are yep, here. Yeah, with a little refueling yeah, probe that, sticking off the front? Uh, is, or forward from that. Forward from that, okay. It's oh, it's black and gray. It looks yeah, like a okay. bubble sticking off the top. That gotcha. is the radar dome on top of our tracer. Gotcha. So that aircraft in the 60s or 70s from above Intrepid could see 250 miles in any direction all the way around. Because <laughs> you get more altitude, you get more yeah, flying exactly. and you have all sorts of sensors Precisely. on there that you can... It's all the curvature of the Earth. Yeah. i got to ask, is this like Intrepid equipment right uh, here? Uh, yes, it is. Can I play my Atari on this? Or... Uh, yeah, probably <laughs> oh, if you no. can get it connected. I uh, probably depends on which which version of the Atari. <laughs> um, definitely an Intellivision though. So this is probably some of the newest original equipment in here. Right. These were installed in late Intrepid service like probably in the 70s. I don't know about this one, but the ones we'll see downstairs are primarily so they can watch takeoff and landing take gotcha. place. Okay. Now before that or even at that time, this is the captain's chair. Right. And we're not allowed to sit in this one. This no, one's actually, no, 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 no. they're preserving this one. <laughs> yeah, best as we can. I like you it. Can I like he's got a little place there for his coffee cup, too. <laughs> the brass coffee cup holder. Exactly. But if you come <laughs> over here and look around a bit, you can see a big rear view mirror like sticking off of a truck there. Right. That's so he can see landing taking place. <laughs> so from his chair, he can see everything going on forward. He's cool. But he uses that mirror to be able to see what's going on in the back of his carrier. <laughs> so there's a massive rear view mirror on, on the aircraft carrier. On board the aircraft carrier. carrier. Yeah, I know. It's weird, right? <laughs> For the captain. And then everybody here, would they have headsets on? Or would they, like, could the captain talk to the navigator, talk to the people out there? What were they doing? So I doubt he'd have a headset on. He'd right. have other people around him that he would pass commands to. And they would relay the commands But forward. absolutely. The other guys that have headsets on, you can see a bit of that. You might also, depending on the communication you're using, just use one of the sound-powered phones. Okay, pick up a phone. Yeah. It's important to bear in mind, I think people conceive of a ship like this as like you're moving like a car or something where everybody's got to be sitting down or flying a plane. Right. And it's it's more like a rolling factory, right? Right, right. You said in a course, you want that guy there in case something goes wrong. But it's not as if moment to moment that absolute focus needs to be there. Right. So the captain might sit here. He might also float around and check around if he's a good captain see what's, see what's going, going on. Because yeah. it isn't that need for the man in command to be in that point constantly focused on what's ahead of them. Gotcha. That makes perfect sense. This is crazy, Chad. Hey, again, one more time. I know there's a lot of people hanging out with us. Uh, we're at the Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum. We're in New York City. This is Mike. He knows a thing or two about Intrepid. He's a tour. What do you want us to call you? Uh, I am senior educator. Senior one of the senior educators. Educator. There you yeah, go. You're yeah, definitely yeah. educating we, us. We today. called ourselves tour guides until a couple months ago. Until That's a couple the months ago. Yeah. There you go. This is, I'll update my email. Um, but we have special permission. The museum's actually closed right now. Again, I cannot say enough. When we're on a virtual field trip like this, we don't just show up with a camera and start streaming on Twitch, right? We have special permission with the museum. There's paperwork involved, all that sort of stuff. So we can come out here. We can get a little bit of Mike's time. Um, we can be in parts of the museum that, that, that right now there's no one in except no. us. It's all this is like afternoon at the museum, I guess. Yeah, this is a rough place to be when we're really busy trying to do something anyway, I think, like oh, this. Oh, you really it gets can't. So packed. Yeah, you really can't. Where we were in there before, too, inside the captain's bridge, that's normally where we put our volunteers, especially right. if they're former crew members. So usually you have 30, 40 people just waiting there, a chance to talk to a former crew yeah, member. Yeah, and then it's like a line of people coming through. Absolutely. Up, there's a queue down there because they only let a certain number of people up here at yeah. a time. So again, chat, we don't just show up and like start live streaming. We talk to the people at the museum. We set this stuff up in advance. Um, at the museums, you'd be surprised when you reach out and you're professional and you're respectful and you talk to the museum, you'd be surprised the places you can live stream from. Just just keep that in mind because I don't want people to think we just show up and turn no. on the stream. All right, we're continuing on to. We're heading down to the Admiral's Bridge. Okay. You want you can take a pretty good perspective from up here of the hangar deck and our aircraft collection. Okay. It's a little eclectic, but to give you kind of an overview, directly opposite us here are our vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Mostly helicopters, but we also happen to have a, um, a, a British Harrier there. Right. Harrier uh, is capable of taking off without uh, a runway. Right. It's got a special nozzle on it that can be angled down to make the thing hover and fly away. Yep, yep. Pretty vital piece of equipment for the British. Excellent. Uh, we have some of our uh, slightly more modern aircraft in the back corner there. Um, you can have 16 in the center, A-12 Blackbirds behind it. It's a spy plane. Yep. And forward of it is an Israeli aircraft called the Kefir. Right, the uh, tan one there, Tim exactly. Brown tan. And you can see that the, the color scheme reflects where it would have been serving. Yeah. Uh, we got our Navy planes, a little harder to see on the side here, some of which are the types that took off from Intrepid, some a little too advanced for it, like our F-14 Tomcat of Top Gun fame that's all the way at the end. 
And this collection here, with the exception of the aircraft all the way at the end, these are our aircraft of the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, the Phantom here, the first one, this is USS Coral Sea on it. That is a uh, fighter aircraft that served on larger carriers during Vietnam, but was a little too big for Intrepid. Okay, never flew off Intrepid? Gotcha. Never flew off. Well, eh, eh, remind okay. me later, we'll get into that. <laughs> gotcha, never gotcha. Never officially assigned to Intrepid. All right, understood. One down from that, we have the uh, Crusader. Now, that's our fighter aircraft from the Vietnam War. Right. Older, not as polished as the Phantom, but a very capable aircraft, a very tough aircraft that earned the uh, nickname the last gunfighter during the Vietnam War. Okay. Very cool plane. The next two in camouflage are actually examples of Vietnamese fighter aircraft, built by the Soviets, but right. then sold in large numbers to their ally, North Vietnam, that our guys faced. Gotcha. Uh, the smaller one is a MiG-17, the larger one's a MiG-21. The MiG-21 is still widely used by countries all over the world to this day. No kidding. And uh, Intrepid pilots knocked down both during the Vietnam War. No kidding. And the last plane down there. Ah, yeah. The last one all the way at the end is uh, uh, a NASA aircraft. Um, off the top of my head, the name escapes me, but that's the aircraft that you would see chasing the space shuttle when it would fly. Right, right. Um, it also uses a trainer for uh, the shuttle pilots. Gotcha. All right, where are we headed to next? Well, we're going to go down to the Admiral's Bridge. Okay, so we're going down a ladder this time. You need me to spot anything or you carry anything? Uh, you good? Just watch. All right, I'll watch you. I'm going to have to flip around backwards, and we have a cameraman who's carrying the camera here, too. Um, I'll let Mike get down first, then I'll go. I'm going to put my phone down. Hang on a second. <laughs> Hang on a second. There we go. <clears throat> You sure you're good there? Folks, it's while they're coming down the stairs, if you're curious about Intrepid's history, she's commissioned in the Navy in 1943, serves through 1974. So she's service in World War II. Right. Retired briefly during the Korean War, but serves again in Vietnam and spends a whole lot of time serving during the Cold War. Gotcha. For retirement in 74, she opens up here in New York in 1982. And with a couple of uh, small exceptions, she's been here ever since. You're good. Yeah. All right. Continuing forward again? Indeed. All right. Chat, this is fantastic. <laughs> I love I love doing stuff like this. I know we're not playing a video game or anything right now, but uh, I'm a fan of the IRL content, so oh, I almost Real, ran into you. I'm sorry. Real <laughs> no, quick before okay. we go in, because I forgot this was here. Take a good look at this guy. This is Admiral Jerry Bogan. He's one of my personal heroes. Right. I'm going to tell you about what he did when we get inside of his bridge, but where we're going right now, this is where the Admiral is in charge. Okay, so the Admiral is He's somebody the captain's who commands boss. the captain's boss. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what he did when we get a little bit further inside. Gotcha. So we're continuing back inside. It's nice when we get inside. Similar idea in here that this is an extension of the room inside. Right. Once open in World War II, closed in now. And you can see it's a lot of similar types of equipment. Okay. And this is... All right, I have to ask. Shoot. Is there some sort of sound deadening or something in here? That's a really good question. Because the acoustics are fantastic they are. in this room. Um, like. I am not aware yeah, of it I mean, from a design point of view, but it would make an awful lot of sense. If yeah. you look at the way the walls are structured, you've got that kind of perforated material here. Yeah. It would make a lot of sense. It's you almost like, like a sound going track. On, you know, the roar of the ship around them, they probably want to make it as quiet as possible. Yeah. That's going to be really important. Chet, I don't, I don't know if y'all could hear that, but when we're outside, there's an echo and you oh, can yeah. hear everything the roar going on. The Hudson and everything else. This is almost like a studio in here. Yeah. I mean, kind of. Like, you know, tell our oral history folks think about recording up here. And then, yeah, there you <laughs> go, right? That's actually really cool. It's just we were talking when we yeah. walked. Absolutely. Yeah, and I noticed it was way different. It's decades of gray paint absorbing the noise. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. <laughs> All right. So, again, chat, uh, stand by. We are going into the center of the island again. If we drop signal, just toss some Fs in chat. So, <laughs> we continue our virtual field trip. Now, where are we? Uh, we are in the Flag Bridge or the Admiral's Bridge. Okay. Now, like we were talking about a moment ago, the Admiral's the captain's boss. The way to think about it is this. When this ship is at sea, it's never alone. Right. right? World War II, it's surrounded by a group of ships called a task group, right? Um, includes other aircraft carriers as well as ships there to support the Intrepid. Now, in uh, one point in World War II, at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, Intrepid is part of Task Group 38.2. It's about a quarter of our major fleet in the battle. Leyte Gulf is the largest battle in naval history. Admiral Bogan, who I pointed out to you outside, is in command of that task group. Gotcha. From this room, he's in charge of three other aircraft carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, uh, 16 to 18 destroyers, totaling about 20,000 men all of whom report back to that one man in this room. The Admiral. The Admiral. Gotcha. Now, he's not issuing orders to 20,000 men. He's issuing orders to maybe about 25 captains on each of those ships. Right. But you think about it, you're there at sea. You've got to have that guy who's an overall commander. In charge somewhere. of everything. Doing the entire orchestra there, Precisely. Right? And usually a larger ship like this, if not a carrier, perhaps a cruiser, is equipped with a bridge designed specifically for that type of command. Was there always an Admiral on board? No. Um, there's always an Admiral's bridge, but they have to remember there's three to four uh, uh, carriers in that group. The right. other Admiral 
Admiral's bridges are probably vacant in the sense that there's not an Admiral of them. Gotcha. So no. this is like the party lounge or something when the Admiral's yeah, not here? Yeah, it's like a spare bedroom in your house. Spare you know? bedroom this in your house. This might be your home office sometimes. This might be where you lock the dog when family comes over. Yeah, that's where I keep my you camera know? equipment until we have there company that comes over. Then i got to clean out the spare bedroom and get all my camera and my stream yeah. equipment Imagine out. the company's the Admiral, you know? <laughs> here you go, but the company's the Admiral. Quite literally, it's, I mean, there's always going to be use. Space is a premium. Right. But the primary function is the Admiral in command. Gotcha. And at Leyte Gulf, that's a pretty important battle. Intrepid sees some of her most significant actions. She helps to sink Japan's largest battleship during that battle, right. the Musashi. And a lot of that comes back to the decisions made by this man in this room for that group of ships Intrepid is part of. Kidding. God. For me, this is, in my opinion, the single most historically significant, at least from a military history point of view, space on board. Right. Because the pivotal role it plays in that battle and in that moment. Understood. God. It's just, I mean... You come into a place like this and you're like, oh, great, it's another place. And when it hits you that this is a real place that people mm -hmm. worked, fought, yeah. perished. I mean, yeah. with all the words, like all the things. This is a real thing that's been all over the world, mm -hmm. right? And this isn't just a building that somebody tossed up with some plywood or sheetrock or something like that. This is a, there's a lot of history in a place like this. So you can imagine people shouting orders mm -hmm. back and stuff like that. This isn't all just very quiet like it is right now. It's sort of humbling, There's I guess. a former crew member who survived the war by the name of Raymond Stone. He right. wrote a book about it called My Ship that we've used extensively, and I had the pleasure of knowing him. He passed away now about two, three years ago. Right. He was here for most of my uh, beginning years at the museum. He talks in his book about how during the worst kamikaze attack, intrepid on November 25th of 44th, hit by two kamikazes about four minutes apart. Right. It's like 9-11. Rescue workers rush in. They're taken out by the second plane. Wow. He is in an area below deck where he's operating his radar equipment. And he, the room's overcome by smoke, and he, the other guys have to leave. He gets right. up to the flight deck, sees what's going on, sees the chaos, realizes there's another radar set up here. Maybe he can get up there and help get on that radar set. He comes barreling through the door there, bumps into Admiral Bogan, and knocks the Admiral over. Wow. Now, he's thinking he's going to get chewed out. The Admiral gets up, picks him back up. You okay, son? Yes, Admiral. I'm here to man the radar set. Okay, go and do that. And then Bogan himself went down to the deck to see if he could help with the wounded. Wow. So you are really right in the thick of all that happening here. Um... It's important to keep that in mind, too. That particular day, again, he's in command of that larger group of ships. Three of his carriers are hit by right. kamikaze aircraft. This one loses 69 men dead, over 150 wounded. It's wow. not out of action for months. He um, is highly regarded for making a decision at one point to turn his entire force, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but essentially there's all this burning fuel puddling up on the deck. Right. And he realized, and I might get the, the direction off on this, but essentially if they turn, because it's if they turn to port, that would tilt the ship that way, so right. the oil would run away from the island rather right. than toward it and back down further into the ship doing more damage. And that split-second decision really makes him pretty highly regarded. He wins an award for it because wow. that contributed to the de de uh, decrease in the loss of life on board. Wow. Just, you know? you, just things like that. That's the sort of thing, like, you could come and you could walk through the museum Absolutely. and you could read all the placards and stuff like that, and you'd, you'd never get stories like that. It's I, I can't say enough that if you come to a museum or something like that, ask about special Absolutely. tour guide programs or something like that where you can get that sort of stories. It might be a scheduled thing or it might not be you just wandering around, but that's the sort of stuff you don't normally get. Thank you. God. The other advice I would offer is for places like this where you have people who might have experienced it, volunteers who are former crew members or a family of former crew members. Right. Sometimes it's hard thinking of a question, ask them. Ask them what they can tell you. Ask them what their favorite story is. Yeah. Because that's usually a good way to get things you might not even think about otherwise. Okay. God. We come a little further in. All right. We're see some of the equipment. On. We've got some radar there. That's air intercept radar. So that right. radar set's going to be looking up at the heavens, trying to see what's going on in terms of aircraft in the area. Okay. And then over here, same idea, we have um, surface radar. This is looking for ships. Okay. It's important to keep in mind, in this context in the Admiral's Bridge, this is not the radar set that the person sitting there is like, oh, no, enemy planes are coming, identifying them. Right. They're here to provide perspective to the men who are in this room who are planning wider operations. Gotcha. But this is pre-digital, so it's not like you can just pop this up on a TV screen like you do today or a computer screen. Right. These are hooked up to a repeater system that takes that main radar signal and dishes it out all over the ship. But just like an old cable box system, you have to have a repeat of that radar set, like the repeat of the cable box, right, right. in each location to display the image. So they can see what's going on. And Precisely. the radar sensor, or the radar antennas, dishes, all way up on top all of it. Yeah, they're all up there still. Whenever we're out on the flight deck, uh, we'll look up and we'll probably be able to see a lot of this. Yeah, stuff, absolutely. Right? And I won't be able to identify them for you because a yeah. lot of them <laughs> Me neither, as sure it turns out. Like <laughs> This device is called a, uh, a DRT, Dead Reckoning. Right. This is basically how they knew before GPS where they were at any given time. See, the map's laid inside. Uh, you can also lay it on the top. You'll see there's a little light bulb in that piece. And basically what happens is 
it's a it's a calculator. You plug in your exact location when you start. Right. It takes very very careful measurements of how fast you're going, any direction changes, anything like that. Computes all the data so that based on where you start and how much it thinks you've moved, it should be able to show you where you are at any given time. Okay. Now, um, of course, you're gonna get errors. And right. After a few hours, you're probably gonna have to stop. Use your equipment to figure out where you are, whether it be like radio beacons, the Loran system, or an earlier time, a sextant in that equipment, right, right. and reprogram the thing. But moment to moment, it doesn't force you to keep constantly redoing the calculations. Right, just to as, the, out where you are. as the velocity and the orientation of the ship changes, it keeps track of that Precisely. with like gyroscopes. Is it gyroscopes? Yeah, probably it is, right? primarily. Yeah, because yeah, gyroscopes keep track of like the orientation. As you turn, it can actually plot a change. I, guess. Yeah, I don't know for sure, but uh, just think of it. I can look at my phone, and my phone can get signals yeah. off of satellites. When the Intrepid was in World War II, there were no satellites. No, 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 no. There were no satellites in orbit. We didn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. Now, you'd have to come up with other ways to be able to keep track of where you it are. It is unbelievable what they were able to do God. at the time and the ingenuity of it, which is important. I mean, it's, we are the free world today because of that ingenuity. Yeah, it's, it's the problem solving. It's, it's one of the coolest things to look back and see. Like Some things are simple, like you've got the rearview mm -hmm. mirror back there so you can see backwards. Mm -hmm. Before, we have all these crazy camera systems and stuff like that. Other things, I know some of the, some of the gun sights have polarization on mm -hmm. them, right? And as you turn the polarization, it'll make things darker or lighter. There was no fancy digital darkening or anything no. like that or automatic system. Like It was literally really just old, I'm going to say old school tech. I mean, I can say old school, right? What fascinates like, me is the amount of math yeah. that a lot of these guys, especially pilots, calculating their fuel and distance and stuff, yeah. had to be capable of doing on the fly or on paper, on a little board on their lap, yep. to be able to figure out where they were and the life and death that goes with it, right? Yeah. Like, we probably learn a higher level of math today in school, but I sure can't do it anymore, Yeah, you know? No, these guys, they, their life depended on the ability to do it. All right, cool. Chat, we still good? Hey, can we just check the battery right quick? Are we good on the battery there? Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. We do How have we the external battery. Time? Um, we have about 10 minutes left, okay. about nine minutes. I want to show you one real quick thing in here we talked about earlier. Let me just slide back this way if you don't mind. All right. So we were talking before about the change of technology, right? My favorite thing to talk about when I used to spend a lot more time here when I first started was this little uh, rotary phone. The old school phone. Which seems ridiculous, but here's the thing. That phone probably installed sometime in the 60s or 70s, right? right? But that guy in 1943 could make a call on that thing. That guy in 1974 could make a call on that thing. I'm 33. When I was in elementary school, we saw those classrooms. I could make a call on that thing. Yeah, I okay, can make somebody, one. Yeah. How yeah. old are you? Uh, 39. Okay, so we're right in the same ballpark. Yeah, there. yeah. But talk to a kid who's maybe five, six years younger than us, put somebody yeah. in their early 20s. Yeah. They have no idea how that thing what works. What is that thing? <laughs> and that's a smaller period of time between us and them than that guy in 43 and that guy in 74. Yeah. But that's what I was getting at about that revolution in technology. Yep. This looks ancient to us, and it probably shouldn't, because we're looking at the 70s right now, not the right. 40s on board. In right, right. But that technology change was very slow for a long time, and then it explodes right after. And that's why this phone is an unbelievable mystery to any child who sees it. <laughs> My daughter would have no clue what to do with that. Precisely. She's like, what is this? She's 13 years old, and she'd be like, well, it has numbers. What is this? Is yeah. it? That's, <laughs> we used to do uh, radio station call-ins. So, you know, it's like, oh, the ninth caller can win tickets to something like that. And we would do them on those phones. Yeah. And to call somebody, you'd be like, one. You had to really work three, for it. Three, like... <laughs> <laughs> No kidding. Yeah. Well, where should we go next? We're getting ready we're to head right on out. Down. All right, we're still going, Chad. Again, we're on a virtual field trip right now. I'm Das. This is my channel. We've got Mike with us, who doing, is folks? a senior educator. Yes. Senior educator with Intrepid Sea and Space Museum. We're in New York City, and uh, this is just the start of our live stream. In just a little bit, we're going to have some scientists from NASA JPL talking to us about searching for life on other planets, worlds, moons. Pluto's a planet. Anyways, we're just gonna keep on uh, keeping on here. <laughs> oh, he's like opening hatches and stuff as we walk. Ah, that was a heavy one. Yeah, I cannot get over all the wires. All the wires. You know, there's a good reason for it. You know, you think about it in your house. You got a lot of wires, a lot yeah. more than you think, right? But you put them behind drywall because you want it to look you don't nice. Want to see it, yeah. Here, people would die if you put it behind drywall to make it look yeah. nice. You need somebody to be able to get in there, find that wire that's broken, and splice it on the fly. God. That's why they're all exposed. But imagine how much training was required yep. for these guys to know how that to works. To know which wire was which. And I'll show you another great example. Why don't we come around this way? Yep. Take a look at that terminal right there on the wall. Okay. That's basically your equivalent of an outlet for the time. <laughs> but here's what's really cool about it. Now, you can see the three prongs there. If I needed a power tool to work on something this area, I could plug right. in and I could pull power off of that. Okay. But there's probably another one just like that, a little further down through these glass areas down there. Right. Power runs across. Let's say, hypothetically, this part of the ship is hit. That room's taken out. 
powers dead to that half of the ship because of it. Right. These things are designed so I can plug in here, run an emergency cable that would have been hanging on the wall periodically throughout the ship so it's available <laughs> to that next terminal plug in and bridge the power across You can like hotwire your aircraft you carrier. You can literally hotwire your aircraft carrier. And they give you the tools to do it mounted on the wall all the time just in case. <laughs> I bet you there's like a rack of patch cables somewhere. Like Without just question. hanging there and you could plug it in here and plug it in there. Everything you could possibly imagine. They would mount tools on the walls there just in case. Just, just so in they're case. Ready. You don't want to be rummaging through your, your tool box whenever you need no. something to... God. It applies to everything on board. We have sick bay on board, right? Yeah, when they yeah. care for the guys. There's also these things called battle dressing stations. There are four of them. Right. In combat, the doctors and um, the corpsmen, essentially nurses and things, they're parceled out to these rooms. So if one's taken out, you still have three other places that can do everything can you need to perform surgery. The redundancy again. Exactly. But here's yeah. my favorite part about that. You only have three doctors on board, right? Four sometimes. Okay. Where do you get the other doctors from to man all this stuff? Well, who else on board has a medical degree besides the uh, medical doctor? The barber? The dentist. The dentist. That was going to go with the if barber. If you're a dentist, well, if we're talking about wounds, bleeding, and stuff, stopping, yeah, that kind of stuff. I don't want the stuff, barber to do that. They have that training. So the dentists are basically there as emergency surgeons doing that alongside the doctors to man these different locations. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Just, this is fantastic. Yeah. Mike, thank you so oh, much. Oh, my for pleasure, the, guys. Oh, God. We're going to keep on going on. Do we need to secure that hat? Nah, I'll come back and close it after. All right, cool. Oh, wow. And again, chat, we're still not done. Um, this is the first hour. We're going to be live until 9 p.m. this evening. Uh, we're getting ready to switch over to the shuttle pavilion, but don't go anywhere. We're not done. You like that? I pointed at the camera. I'm like, what am I going to say next? Don't go anywhere. <laughs> like, stay tuned <laughs> next time on, I don't know. So a couple of quick things Twitch while streamer. we're out here. Uh, if you look over here, Notice that kind of wooden space that's kind of parceled right, off over right. there? It looks like a porch. That's actually one of our aircraft elevators. We've ridden that before oh, you have. with the okay, stream. So you know yeah. how it works then. So we've, uh, we've actually taken the stream equipment over there and ridden up the aircraft because they do it like uh, every hour, every other yeah, every hour. Every couple hours like across the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty vital part of operations on yep. board. The main thing that I wanted to point out to you guys while we're out here is right around the front here. Okay. Ship's nickname. I, I, this is one of my favorite stories. It's a fun story. Gotcha. Our stuff is still here too. That's yeah, good. that's a good, good sign. <laughs> Whew, our stuff is security still work, but you know, would you really want to rob the aircraft carrier? Yeah. It'd be hard to get these planes off the deck. Uh, fighting <laughs> Eye, right? Uh, pretty cool nickname. Oh, Not Intrepid's way. original nickname. Originally, Intrepid was called the Mighty Eye. Went through World War II like that. Right. 1954, after World War II shipping retired for a little while, Intrepid's being rebuilt. Intrepid's back in service in 54. Yep. And um, the guy who's captain at the time, I kid you not, his name was Ed Outlaw. Ed Outlaw. Love the last name. Okay. Ed Outlaw had been on Admiral Bogan's staff on Intrepid during World War II through some of the worst of the fighting. So this man came right. back to Intrepid as captain later. So Outlaw's in command. We pull up, I believe, in Norfolk, Virginia, alongside a brand new carrier of the Forestall class called the Independence. Okay. Now, Independence, his captain starts kind of ripping on Outlaw. He's like, oh, look at your little ship. I guess my ship, the Independence, is the mighty eye now. Right. Well, not to be outdone, Outlaw, a veteran, says to him, well, fine. You can call your ship the mighty eye. I guess it's bigger now. Right. But your ship's green as grass. My ship was through the worst of what the Japanese could throw out in World War II. My ship's proven itself in combat, so from now on, I'm calling my ship the Fighting the Eye. The Fighting Eye. And that's where that nickname comes from, and it has stuck to this day. Nice. It's right up here on the yeah. uh, on the front of the island. island. Yes. The front of the island. Yeah, another island. <laughs> Superstructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Superstructure would also be equally appropriate. Yeah, superstructure. All right, there you go. It's like a more technical sounding yeah. term. We like technical terms. Um, that is about our time for now, Perfect. Mike. Um, we are not done, Chet. Don't worry. You are here after hours. You've taken time, like after the museum's closed, to come and give us this fantastic tour of the it's island. My pleasure, Mike. That's it's so cool. People here just people in, in chat just said the Intrepid has such fantastic tour guides. Some people said they've been here before and they took a tour and it was fantastic. Excellent. Um, so many good stories, Chet. What I want you all to do is show Mike some appreciation. Again, Mike Marta, um, the senior educator. Yeah, a senior educator. A senior educator. A senior educator with the Intrepids here in Space Museum here in New York City. Put some hearts in chat, and I'm going to show him my phone. Here's a, We should get some people spamming some hearts here. Wow. Shortly. Also, we got about six and uh, 6,500 people watching right now. There's a couple people. Normally, you do a tour, and there's like 20 people in front of you, 30 uh, people. I saw so, one here was Avenger something. Uh, I know that's probably for the movies, but I'm going to pretend it's for the Avenger aircraft downstairs. <laughs> it is, thank there you are. very much, folks. Mike, thank you so much for the time. My pleasure, guys. Chat.
Um, here's what we got to do. We need to take a break for just a second. Uh, we actually have a microphone and yeah. mic, and I have to Mike steal my mic. mic back. Yeah, we got to steal the mic back. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Be Right Back screen for probably 60 seconds. I always say that, then it's like more than 60 seconds. Um, don't go anywhere. We are about to walk down to the shuttle pavilion. And uh, when we walk down to the shuttle pavilion, we have some special guests from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory talking to us about the search for life and water on other worlds. That's coming up. Don't go anywhere. Just going to switch streams. Again, Mike, thank you. So I'm going to say your hand again. That's one of the and, most uh, fantastic things. Happy National Water Day. Yeah, happy National Water Day. We figured it was an aircraft carrier. Oh, your best place to come. Best place to come for World Water Day, right? All right, chat. Hang 10, and we will be right back. And then I very awkwardly count to seven because that's the delay. And then I will press the correct stream button.